So, after the, well, let's be frank, complete failure of my other video, I decided to just, you know, have some fun with this one. And I feel like I didn't get enough time to spend with actual human-shaped mouths, so without further ado, let's go ahead into... So nasalization is kind of the norm in mammals. That is kind of the point of the secondary palate to separate the nose and mouth and the noses for breathing. A pig's epiglottis is not contiguous with the soft palate, but they are aligned. When most people mimic a pig's sound, they use the ingressive velar trill, but a pig's signature oinking sounds aren't inwards, they're outwards. So if they're breathing out the nose, how do they create frication? Well, if you try to breathe out through the nose really fast, you'll notice it gets stuck. That's because this kind of airflow forces the uvula upwards to rest against the wall of the nasopharynx. But if you keep trying to force it through, it should produce a sound. That's a snort. Now, if you tried that out, you might have noticed, wow, that didn't sound pleasant or consistent, and it kind of hurt. Well, it'll hurt a lot more if you keep doing it because the nasopharynx is way too soft for frication and the uvula exists, but pigs don't have a uvula, it's unique to humans, and also don't need a sharp frication because their nose is more designed for acoustics, so that appears to create a new place of articulation. However, it isn't really. You need somewhere in the mouth to be closed, otherwise the pressure just redirects out the mouth. So really, every manner of articulation gets a new nasal pair, except nasal and approximate, those just pair up, that can be applied to any place. That occurs after the pharynx. That leaves another characteristic of mammals. The mouth and nose complex is extended away from the face, creating a snout. The lack of that is important to humans, placing us in the suborder half a nose. The upshot is the hard and soft palate are just longer in other mammals. That might allow for a distinct pre-velar place of articulation between palatal and velar, and its corresponding retroflex pre-velar considering that pigs have a longer tongue than in humans. However, they still suffer under the lack of a descended larynx. Is they is way out hey a way ig pay ud way octay. Unlike all other reptiles, crocodiles have not yet lost their vocal cords, and again, unlike all other reptiles, crocodiles have developed a secondary palate, so really their mouth is very similar to a mammal's. That means we can focus on the differences. So in humans, the tongue is used in most of the places of articulation. That makes it difficult, then that crocodiles can't move their tongues. Now, the palatal fold does allow for velar, but otherwise that leaves only the labial and pharyngeal places of articulation. And possibly the labiodental, but when I looked up crocodile teeth, all I found was a Nicki Minaj song, and the pharynx isn't really tight enough to constrict, and they don't have mammalian lips, so that's also restricted sonorants only. So crocodiles really don't have much going for them. Now, fortunately, alligators can move their tongues, but even then, they're shaped really differently. It's probably not dexterous enough for the post-alveolar to say nothing of the teeth, and the back of the tongue is still anchored to the velum at the palatal fold, which probably removes the palatal. Not being humans, they have no uvula. However, crocodiles do have a very long face, so here's my division. Labial, labiodental, and dental, which are restricted to sonorates. Alveolar, first retroflex, second retroflex, velar, which I would actually rename to the palatal, and glottal. With the way the palatal fold is designed, clicks would be even easier than in humans, and the glottis is much the same. Now, in humans, the soft palate defaults directing air into the mouth, but gators don't have that, so all sounds are nasalized. But the nostrils can be closed, so there is a way to distinguish between nasal and actually releasing out the nose. So now back over to fish. So, with regard to this topic, there are two different kinds of fish. Physostomes, like the trout, can use their mouth to refill their swim bladder, hence the name. Physoclists, like perch, have their swim bladder closed off from their mouth hence the name. In these fish, there is no air, the digestive tract, and only the digestive tract attached to the mouth. So how do you make a sound with no airflow? Well, maybe you could use water, but water doesn't really work. Even though it carries sound better, it's much harder to get sound started, especially at a small scale due to surface tension. Well, even though the swim bladder is sealed off, you can still use drummer muscles, but without a mouth to shape it, you're basically creating a single sound. It's no better than clapping. Speaking of which, there are percussives, like snapping the teeth or flapping the gills, but those don't really carry. So, are we doomed? Can fish not speak? Well, what if you could vocalize without using a larynx? This is called alaryngeal speech, and it comes down to, well, use somewhere else besides the larynx. The two big ones are buccal speech in the cheek and esophageal speech in the stomach. Buckle speech requires the cheek to vibrate against the gums, which is impossible because fish don't have gums. Their teeth are recessed, so they can't cut the cheek off from the mouth. But esophageal speech is fully possible. 
Now, if you've ever had a laryngectomy, you should know that esophageal speech really sucks, it barely works, it hurts to do, screw esophageal speech, all my homies hate esophageal speech. In terms of mouth shape, there's really not a difference between the two groups, so a perch has the same phonology. Or lack thereof, seeing how unintelligible the trout was. No, I can't. I refuse. It's so sharks never even had a swim bladder in the first place. They mostly just store a bunch of oil in their liver. So esophageal speech again? Well, it's not really that simple. You see, sharks breathe through something called ram ventilation, whereby they have to use their momentum forward to force water through the gills. Sharks constantly need water flow in this direction, which would eliminate speech altogether. Except not really. Some sharks also use buckle pumping, even if it's less efficient, and even the ones that couldn't could just hold their breath. Great white sharks are notable for popping their head above water to get a look at their surroundings, so ultimately, shark speech sounds basically the same as physoclist speech, although they lack pharyngeal jaws. No, I'm not doing it again. <laughs> So lampreys, lacking jaws, can't close their mouth. They also can't really force air into their digestive tract. Lampreys need to use their mouths to suck. So the musculature they use for breathing is located in the gills, which are separated by this part, which actually is called the velum. They can't squeeze air into the esophagus. They have no cheeks, no air bladder, nowhere in the mouth to store air. Regrettably, lampreys must become the gangsters of the animal kingdom because they move in silence. So it may surprise you that this thing is our closest relative outside the vertebrates, but in its larval stage it resembles a fish type thing. As a sea squirt matures, it becomes essentially a giant mouth. It sucks in whatever it can, filters the water out through the holes in the pharynx, and empties all of that out through this tube. Now, if you were a human, this tube would be your ear, but since you aren't, it's just an empty hole, so how would they speak? Well, they wouldn't, they have no vibration. I just wanted to showcase a cool animal. Maybe if they lived in air, they could force the slits to vibrate the air, but they couldn't survive up here since you can't filter feed in the air. Well, unless there was a lot of pollen, but my specevo ideas are another video. Ah! So now that we're back on land, at least mostly, we can discuss airflow again. However, we're just in time for a new problem. Starfish can't really burp because their esophagus doesn't constrict. That's why they need to do stomach aversion. They can't force prey down to the stomach, so they have to force the stomach up to the prey. Now, starfish do have another possibility, the madreporic ampulla, or crusty hole, which is pumped by the axial organ, but that also comes with challenges. With humans and trout, the lungs and air bladder are meant to hold air. The stomach? Eh, yeah, fish swallow worse than air. But the madreporic ampulla is not just the entrance to the respiratory system. It also functions as the circulatory system, and the urinary system when going out. Also, it's useful for muscular function. And it's necessary for the reproductive system to function correctly. And it forms one of the starfish's skeleton. If you get air into the hemal system, the entire starfish breaks. They don't have anything to vibrate. Oh, I guess that makes sense. They can't hear sounds either. Looking at arthropods in general, crustaceans, insects, and spiders all contain a number of members that can chirp, click, and sing, and approximately none of them use airflow to do so. The conventional wisdom would be that vertebrates are the woodwinds and brass, and invertebrates are the percussion and strings. The basic idea is that when two high-friction objects rub against each other, they peel off, creating vibration as they snap back together. This technique is called stridulation, and it really doesn't matter what parts of the body you're rubbing together, legs, legs and wings, legs and face, mouth parts, you name it, someone's rubbing them together to make sound. It's a far cry from what we're used to, nevertheless, if you can control the pitch, you can produce vowels, and they can control it by changing how fast the rubbing is and how tightly pressed the articulators are, those being the sonorants, the obstruents have to be percussive, creating a chain of claps and rubbing. But that's the way they do vocalize. If they were to try it, could they vocalize like a human? 
Well, not really. Land arthropods have no airflow, they just sort of let the air go in and out of the bodies on its own. Sea arthropods breathe water, and the motion they use to force water into the gills doesn't work with air. What about the mouth? Well, the way we vertebrates swallow is interesting. Basically, the tongue is used to handle the food back to the pharynx, where it's pushed downwards like a piston. Arthropods don't have a tongue. They can still use the mouth parts to poke it down, but it doesn't work on fluids, which instead have to painstakingly trickle down the throat. That's why it takes spiders like seven hours to drink water. Now, are there any other orifices where air can be squeezed into? Well, the anus, but when I tried to research that, I was reminded of the human centipede, so I stopped researching it and just decided to assume it's unfeasible. Mollusks can't produce sound. Most of them have two holes, the breath hole or siphon, which again uses muscular action that doesn't work on air, and the mouth, which is never available to the air. They swallow things by submerging them in mucus, then swallowing the mucus. Air can't get in except in the form of bubbles. But that leaves the octopus. And despite how far we've come, an octopus, finally, has an esophagus resembling a human that uses musculature to force prey downwards. That means it could force air in, air go, force air out, vibrate muscles, esophageal speech. Now all we need to know is what the mouth is shaped- yeah, crap. So one thing that's pretty important about octopi is that they have no skeleton. Sure, they have musculature that stays kind of firm when flexed, but the operative point being that they have no fixed shape. Octopuses can change the shape of their mouths to produce any place of articulation that you can imagine, so why don't we hear it? Well, we don't see octopi out of water that much, and like I said, esophageal speech kind of sucks, but if they ever evolve to be terrestrial, you can expect octopuses to be capable of mimicking speech. And for those reasons, I have decided a humanoid octopus species will be the native speakers of Chavalries. This is how an octopus would- This is how a human would talk. And that closes us out on animals. From here on out, there is no airflow, no rapid motion, no nothing. A vast expanse of silence awaits beyond the Nephrozoans. So what did we learn? Well, speech is very rare in the animal kingdom, so your throat is amazing. Put it to good use. Pause, let me try that again.